Good evening, everyone. It's time for the Showcase Showdown. Um, this is what everyone's been requesting. Um, I have purposely been holding off reporting because I know everybody wanted to read this book. The level of inboxes, emails, comments, tags. Um, this is the book everyone has been waiting for. Hi, Daphne. First off, hello to everyone, both on Facebook and on YouTube. Um, we're going to get into it. I'm going to wait maybe a few minutes for everybody to get in. I will say this. Um, I'm going to be quite frank. I get a little tired of reading Donald Trump books. Um, because I, A, don't want to give him that much press. I mean, not that you can avoid it, but um, also, too, I just feel like in these times, I like to put my energy into more productive and positive spaces. Um, but this is one that I just couldn't avoid. Um, I must say, previewing this book, it's probably the easiest read I've done since Omarosa. Um, and that's just being honest. A lot of these Trump books either they're telling information that we as the public already fucking know or it's being told at such a high level that it's like, bitch, what, is, what in the fuck is you talking about? Like, I don't even understand it. Um, what I like about this Mary Trump book is that... Um, it is so direct and so to the point, like she understands, she's telling the story. And it's funny because even though she's a psychologist or a psychiatrist, one of those things, um, it's told on a level that you can understand. Another thing that I appreciate about the book is that um, it is, she's honest about some shit. I wasn't there. These are family recollections. But the shit that she remember, the bitch goes in, okay? She goes in. Um, like I said, I, I don't really like reading a lot of Trump books, which is why you don't see me reading a lot. Or if I do, I'll stop after one chapter. Because quite frankly, I don't want to give give them, um, give him, I, I, I just have to protect my energy and I have to protect my mind. And I think we all have to do that, especially living in a time that we're living in. So with that being said, um, yes, my sleeves are like a fishnet. It's like a fishnet sleeve. Um, with that being said, hello everyone. We have a full house already. I'm going to go ahead and get started because these chapters are kind of long. Um, and give it to you straight, no chases. So we're going to start with the prologue. Bitch, you know the book is the T. When the prologue is a moment... The prologue, bitch, is a moment. You know it's the tea. So, I'd always liked my name. As a kid at sailing camp in the 1970s, everybody called me Trump. It was a source of pride. Not because the name was associated with power and real estate. Back then, my family was unknown outside of Brooklyn and Queens. But because something about the sound of it suited me. A tough six-year-old afraid of nothing. In the 1980s, when I was in college and my Uncle Donald had started branding all of his buildings in Manhattan, my feelings about my name became more complicated. 30 years later, on April 4th, 2017, I was in the quiet car of an Amtrak train headed to Washington, D.C. for a family dinner at the White House. Ten days earlier, I had received an email inviting me to a birthday celebration for my aunts Marianne turning 80 and Elizabeth turning 75. Their younger brother Donald had occupied the Oval Office since January. After I emerged into Union Station with its vaulted ceilings and black and white marble floors, I passed a vendor who had set up an easel with buttons for sale. My name in a red circle with a red slash through it. Deport Trump, dump Trump, and Trump is a witch. I put on my sunglasses and picked up my pace. 
bitch got shook. I took a cab to the Trump International Hotel, which was my comp comping my family for one night after checking in. I walked through the atrium. Uh, bitch, first off, only one night, bitch. The cheapness, okay. I walked in through the atrium and looked up at the glass ceiling and the blue sky beyond. The three-tiered crystal chandeliers that hung from the central beam of interconnected girders arching overhead cast a soft light. On one side, armchairs, settees, and couches, royal blue, robin's egg blue, ivory, were arranged in small groups. On the other, tables and chairs circled a large bar where I was later scheduled to meet my brother. I had expected the hotel to be vulgar and gilded. It wasn't. So this bitch is giving Golden Girls teas, bitch. She's giving picture it. April 2017, bitch. I slightly live, okay? My mom, my room was also tasteful. But my name was plastered everywhere on everything. Trump shampoo, Trump conditioner, Trump slippers, Trump shower cap, Trump shoe polish, Trump sewing kit, Trump bathrobe. I opened the fridge, refrigerator, grabbed a split of Trump white wine, and poured it down my Trump throat so it could course through my Trump bloodstream and hit the pleasure center of my Trump brain. Ah! Come on, bitch! I'm here for it. An hour later, I met my brother, Frederick Christ, or Chris Trump the third. Who now, first of all, this had to be an oldest bitch. Who the fuck names their child Frederick Christ, bitch? Not Frederick Chris. Okay, this is white people shit. No shade to my white followers, but black people don't name their children Chris, bitch. Okay? Whom I've called Fritz, Fritz since we were kids and his wife Lisa. Soon we were joined by the rest of our party. My Aunt Marianne, the eldest of Fred and Mary Trump's five children, and a respected federal appeals court judge, my Uncle Robert, the baby of the family, who for a short time had been one of Donald's employees in Atlantic City before leaving on bad terms in the early 1990s, and his girlfriend. My Aunt Elizabeth, the middle Trump child, and her husband, Jim, my cousin David, Desmond, Marianne's only child and the oldest Trump grandchild, and his wife, and a few of my aunt's closest friends. The only Trump sibling who would be missing from the celebration was my father, Frederick Chris Trump Jr., the oldest son, whom everybody had called Freddie. He had died more than 35 years before. When we were finally all together, we checked in with the White House security agents outside, then piled haphazardly into the two White House vans like a JV lacrosse team. Some of the older guests had trouble negotiating the steps. Nobody was comfortable squeezing onto the bench seats. I wonder why the White House hadn't thought to send at least one limo for my aunts. So, bitch, the gagger. So, he's already cheap, bitch. He's only comping for one night, and he got them packed in this damn sprinter van like a, like a fucking clown car, bitch. I am here for this shit already. This is what we came to see, okay? As we pulled into the South Lawn driveway ten minutes later... Two guards came out of the security hut to inspect the underside of the van before we drove through the front gate. After a short drive, we stopped at a small security building adjacent to the East Wing and disembarked. We went inside one by one as our names were called, handed over our phones and bags, and walked through a metal detector. Once inside the White House, we walked in twos and threes through the long corridors, past windows looking out on gardens and lawns, past life-size paintings of former first ladies. I stopped in front of Hillary Clinton's portrait and stood silently for a minute. I wonder again how this could have happened. There was no reason for me to ever have imagined that I visit the White House, certainly not under these circumstances. The whole thing felt surreal. I looked around. The White House was elegant, grand, and stately, and I was about to see my uncle, the man who lived here for the first time in eight years. Bitch, <laughs> the shade. I, I can shade already, bitch. The shade. I can't. We emerged from the shadows of the hallway onto the portico surrounding the Rose Garden and stopped outside the Oval Office. Through the French doors, I could see that a meeting was still in progress. 
Vice President Mike Pence stood off to the side, but Speaker of the House Paul Ryan, Senator Chuck Schumer, and a dozen other Congress people and staffers were gathered around Donald, who sat behind the resolute desk. The table loo reminded me of one of my grandfather's antics. He always made his supplicants come to him, either at his Brooklyn office or his house in Queens, and he remained seated while they stood. In late autumn 1985, first off, bitch, you hear, like, this is learned behavior. This is a tradition that we're seeing here, okay? Tradition. In late autumn 1985, a year after I had taken leave of absence from Tufts University, I took my place in front of him and asked his permission to return to school. He looked up at me and said, that's stupid. What do you want to do that for? Just go to trade school and become a receptionist. Because I want to get my degree. I must have said it with a hint of annoyance because my grandfather narrowed his eyes and looked at me for a second as if reevaluating me. The corner of his mouth lifted in a sneer and he laughed. That's nasty, he said. It runs in the family, bitch. I'm just saying, okay? Because I, a few minutes later, the meeting broke up. The Oval Office was both smaller and less intimate than I'd imagined. My cousin Eric and his wife Laura, whom I never met, were standing right by the door. So I said, hi, Eric. It's your cousin Mary. Of course I know who you are. I want to say, of course I know who you are, bitch, because I feel like that's what he meant. So I'm going to say, of course I know who you are, bitch, he said. Well, it's been a while, I said. I think the last time we saw each other was still in high school. He shrugged and said, that's probably true. He and Laura walked away without his introducing us. So first off, bitch, she never met the wife, okay? He goes, she goes and talks to him. He like, bitch, who the fuck is you? Oh, yeah, that's right. You my cousin, bitch. I know who you is and whatever. Moving on. That's what he gave her. Okay. <laughs> he and Laura walked away with us, his introducing us. I looked around. Melania, Ivanka, Jared, and Donnie had arrived and were standing next to Donald, who remained seated. Mike Pence continued to lurk on the other side of the room with a half-dead smile on his face, like the chaperone everyone wanted to avoid. I stared at him, hoping to make eye contact, but he never looked my way. Excuse me, everyone. The White House photographer, a, a petite young woman in a dark pantsuit, announced in an upbeat voice, Let's get you all together so I can take some pictures before we go upstairs. She instructed us to surround Donald, who had still not gotten up from the desk. The photographer raised her camera. One, two, three, smile, she said. After the pictures had been taken, Donald stood up and pointed to a framed black and white photograph of my grandfather, which was propped up on a table behind the desk. Marianne, isn't that a great picture of Dad? It was the same photograph that had sat on the side table in the library of my grandparents' house. In it, my grandfather was still a young man, with receding dark hair, a mustache, and a look of command that I had never seen falter until his dementia set in. We'd all seen it thousands of times. Maybe you should have a picture of mom too, Marianne suggested. That's a great idea, Donald said, as though it had never occurred to him. Somebody get me a picture of mom. Bitch... I'm moving on. We spent a few more minutes in the Oval Office, taking turns sitting behind the Resolute desk. My brother took a picture of me, and when I looked at it later, I noticed my grandfather hovering behind me like a ghost. The White House historian joined us just outside the Oval Office, and we proceeded to the executive residence on the second floor for a tour to be followed by dinner. Once upstairs, we proceeded to the Lincoln bedroom. I took a quick look inside and was surprised to see a half-eaten apple on the bedside table. As the historian told us stories about what had happened in the room through the years, Donald pointed vaguely once in a while and declared, This place has never looked better since George Washington lived here. The historian was too polite to point out that the house hadn't been opened until after Washington died. Washington, bitch. I can't. This is America. 
you did this. This is your fault, bitch. I'm just saying. <laughs> the group, the group moved down the hall toward the treaty room and the executive dining room. Donald stood in the doorway, greeting people as they entered. I was one of the last to arrive. I hadn't yet said hello, and when he saw me, he pointed at me with a surprised look on his face, then said, I specifically asked for you to be here. That was the kind of thing he often said to charm people, and he had a knack for tailoring his comment to the occasion, which was all the more impressive because I knew it wasn't true. He opened his arms, and then, for the first time in my life, he hugged me. Bitch, he was putting it on for this goddamn dinner, bitch. Okay? The first thing I noticed about the executive dining room was its beauty. The dark wood polished to perfection. The exquisite place settings. And the hand-drawn calligraphy on the place cards and menus. Iceberg lettuce salad, mashed potatoes, Trump family staples, and Wagyu beef filet. The second thing I noticed about sitting down was the seating arrangement. In my family, you could always gauge your worth by where you were seated, but I didn't mind. All of the people I felt comfortable with, my brother and sister-in-law, Marianne's stepdaughter and her husband, were seated near me. Each of the waiters carried a bottle of red wine and a bottle of white. Real wine, not Trump wine. That was unexpected. Bitch, she's shading the wine, okay? In my entire life, there had never been any alcohol at a family function. Only Coke and apple juice had been served at my grandparents' house. Halfway through the meal, Jared walked into the dining room. Jared Kushner. Oh, look, Ivanka said, clapping her hands. Jared's back from his trip to the Middle East, as if we hadn't just seen him in the Oval Office. He walked over to his wife, gave her a quick kiss on the cheek, then bent over to Donald who was seated next to Ivanka. They spoke quietly for a couple of minutes, and then Jared left. He didn't acknowledge anybody else, not even my aunts. As he crossed the threshold, Donnie leapt out of his chair and bounded after him like an excited puppy. As dessert was being served, Robert stood up, wine glass in hand. It is such an honor to be here with the President of the United States, he said. Thank you, Mr. President, for allowing us to be here to celebrate our sister's birthdays. I thought back to the last time the family had celebrated Father's Day at Peter Luger's Steakhouse in Brooklyn, bitch. Ah! Okay. Then, as now, Donald and Rob had been sitting next to each other with me directly across from them. Without any explanation, Donald had turned to Rob and said, look, he bared his teeth and pointed at his mouth. What, Rob asked. Donald had simply pulled his lips back further and pointed more emphatically. Rob had started to look nervous. I had no idea what was going on, but I watched with amusement while I sipped my Coke. So she's like, bitch, sipping this tea. So he's pointing to his mouth, Donald Trump. Look, Donald had said through his gritted teeth, what do you think? What do you mean? Rob's embarrassment was palpable. He had glanced around him to make sure nobody was looking at him and whispered, Is there something in my teeth? The bowls of screamed spinach scattered around the table rendered that a distinct possibility. Donald had relaxed his mouth and stopped pointing. The contemptuous look on his face summed up the entire history of their relationship. I got my teeth whitened. What do you think? He asked dryly. <sighs> Got a bag and fixed my teeth. Let these hoes know it ain't cheap. After Rob's remarks, Donald shot him the same dismissive look I'd seen at Peter Luger's almost 20 years before. Then, diet coke glass in hand, Donald made some perfunctory remarks about my aunt's birthdays, after which he gestured towards his daughter-in-law. Laura there, he said. I barely even knew who the fuck she was. Honestly, but then she gave a great speech during the campaign and Georgia supported me. By then, Laura and Eric had been together for almost eight years, so presumably Donald had at least met her at their wedding. But it sounded as if he hadn't known who she was until she had said something nice about him at a campaign rally during the election. As usual with Donald, the story mattered more than the truth. 
which was easily sacrificed, especially if a lie made the story sound better. When Mary Ann's turn came, she said, I want to thank you for making a trip to celebrate our birthdays. We've come a long way since that night when Freddie dumped a bowl of mashed potatoes on Donald's head because he was being such a brat. <laughs> Family gonna let you know, bitch. Everybody familiar with the legendary mashed potato story laughed, everyone except Donald, who listened with his arms tightly crossed and a scowl on his face, and he's, as he did whenever Marianne mentioned it. It upset him, as if he were that seven-year-old boy. He clearly still felt the sting of that long-ago humiliation. This motherfucker is bananas. Unprompted, my cousin Donnie, who returned from chasing down Jared, stood up to speak. Instead of toasting our aunts, he gave a sort of campaign speech. Last November, the American people saw something special and voted for a president who they knew understood them. They saw what a great family this is, and they connected with our values. I glanced at my brother and rolled my eyes. This bitch is shady. I can't. I flagged down one of the waiters. Can I have some more wine? So she like, bitch, I can't. I'm about to get drunk. He returned quickly with two bottles and asked if I preferred red or white. Yes, please, I said. As soon as we finished dessert, everybody rose. Only two hours had elapsed since we'd entered the Oval Office, but the meal was over and it was time to leave. From beginning to end, we had spent about twice as much time at the White House as we had ever at my grandparents' house for Thanksgiving or Christmas, but still less time with Donald than Kid Rock, Sarah Palin, and Ted Nugent, who would two weeks later. So the gaga is, he don't really fuck with his family. That's the crazy part, bitch. He had them coming for this dinner, which was basically a photo op, bitch. He like, hurry up, bitch. I need to shit on. Basically, it was, I'm getting ready to shit on these bitches and let them know, look, bitch, I'm the president. I got my teeth done, bitch. Y'all eating on my motherfucking coin, bitch. Live. Salute me. Okay? <laughs> I can't. Somebody suggested that we all take individual pictures with Donald, though not with the guests of honor. When it was my turn, Donald smiled for the camera and gave a thumbs up, but I could see the exhaustion behind the smile. It seemed that keeping up the cheerful facade was wearing on him. Don't let them get you down, I said to him as my, mother, my brother took the picture. It wasn't long after his first national security advisor had been fired in disgrace, and the cracks in his presidency were already beginning to show. Donald jutted out his chin and clenched his teeth. Looking for a moment like the ghost of my grandfather. They're not going to get me, he said. When Donald announced his run for the presidency on June 16, 2015, I didn't take it seriously. As most of America, nobody thought that this shit was going to be real. Even his own fucking niece didn't think that this shit was going to be real. Okay? I, th I didn't think Donald took it seriously. He simply wanted the free publicity for his brand. He'd done that sort of thing before. When his polls numbers started to rise and he may have received ta tacit assurances from Russian President Vladimir Putin that Russia would do everything if it could to swing the election in his favor, the pe appeal of winning grew. So she's saying, Miss Murray, let's, let's unpack this. Miss Murray is saying, bitch... Nobody believed it was the real thing. Donald didn't even believe it was the real thing. But then when Vladimir Putin stepped in because he saw that he had a fucking idiot, okay, he was like, wait a minute, bitch. I might can do this. He's a clown, my Aunt Marianne said during one of our regular lunches at the time. This will never happen. I agree. We talked about how his reputation as a faded reality star and failed businessman would do his run. Does anybody even believe the bullshit that he's a self-made man? What has he even accomplished on his own, I ask. Well, Marianne said, as dry as the Sahara, he has had five bankruptcies. Bitch! I can't! I cannot! So the family, the family, the niece, and the, all, everybody is like, bitch... They thinking, I feel like everybody was knew what was going on but American citizens, okay? It, it's giving, they reading in this book, bitch. 
Um, when Donald started addressing the opioid crisis and using my father's history with alcoholism to burnish his anti-addiction bona fides to seem more sympathetic, both of us were very angry. He's using your father's memory for political purposes, Marianne said, and that's a sin, especially since Freddie should have been the star of the family. We thought the blatant racism on display during Donald's announcement speech would be a deal breaker. But we were disabused of the idea when Jerry Falwell Jr. and other white evangelists started endorsing him. Marianne, a devout Catholic, says her conversion five decades earlier was incense. What the fuck is wrong with them, she said. The only time Donald went to church was when the cameras were there. It's mind-boggling. He has no principles. None. So this is the devout, first of all, bitch, you a devout Catholic talking about what the fuck, but I'm not going to judge. Second of all, it's interesting to point out how even the family, even the family is thinking that all of these things are going to be strikes against them. The racism, the financial record, um, you know, him not being self-made, the evangelical, all of, we're all thinking that this is going to be a thing. And then fast forward, looking at the world that we're in now, none of that shit still matters. Okay? Nothing Donald said during the campaign, from his disparagement of Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, arguably the most qualified presidential candidate in the history of the country as a nasty woman, to his mocking of Serge Kovaleski, a disabled New York Times reporter, deviated from my expectation of him. Remember that when he talked about the reporter? Now, I don't know if Hillary was the most qualified presidential candidate, bitch, in the history of the country. I, she may be. I don't know, but bitch, you definitely was, you know, a Hillary fan. We can tell she's a Hillary fan. In fact, I was reminded of every family meal that I ever attended during which Donald had talked about all of the women he considered ugly, fat slobs or the men, usually more accomplished or powerful, he called losers, while my grandfather and Marianne, Elizabeth and Robert all laughed and joined in. That kind of casual dehumanization of people was commonplace at the Trump dinner table. What did surprise me was that he kept getting away with it. Mm. Then he received the nomination. The things I had thought would disqualify him seem only to strengthen his appeal to his base. I still wasn't concerned. I was confident he would never be elected. But the idea that he had a shot at it was unnerving. Late in the summer of 2016, I considered speaking about the ways I knew Donald to be completely unqualified. By this time, he had emerged relatively unscathed from the Republican National Convention and his call for Second Amendment people to stop Hillary Clinton. Even his attack on Kizar and Ghazala Khan, gold star parents whose son, Humayun, a U.S. Army captain, had died in Iraq, seemed not to matter. Y'all remember that? That was during a campaign when they had the... um. The two parents, I believe they did interviews and all that shit. She bringing up, she, she, she bringing back memories, bitch. When the majority of, of the of Republicans polled still supported him after the Access Hollywood tape was released. That's the tape with Billy Bush. Where they were saying, you just got to grab him by the pussy. They like that shit, okay? I knew he, I had made the right decision. I began to feel as though I was watching my family history. And Donald's central role in it playing out on a grand scale. Donald's competition in the race was being held to higher standards, just as my father had always been, while he continued to get away with and even be rewarded for increasingly crass, irresponsible, and despicable behavior. This can't possibly be happening again, I thought, but it was. So let's go back to that. If we recall all of the candidates in 2015-2016 all the Republican candidates that were out. She's absolutely right. You had Jeb Bush in that poll. Marco Rubio was in that poll. There was a lot of people in that poll. And I think we were grading, even, even Democrats, because let's be honest, I remember seeing people, and I'm even guilty of this myself. I'm not going to say I'm innocent. I remember thinking, he's such a joke. 
I just want him to make it to the debates because I know it's going to be hilarious. Because in a lot of our minds, we didn't think that it would actually happen. And I think the lesson as a country, well, for most of us as a country, that we will learn from this presidency is take everything seriously. Take every candidate seriously. Take every issue seriously. Because when you don't, this is what happens. The media failed to notice that not one member of Donald's family, apart from his children, his son-in-law, and his current wife, said a word in support of him during the entire campaign. Bitch, that's low-key true. That's low-key true. I don't recall hearing from nobody else in the family, bitch. Marianne told me she was lucky because as a federal judge, she needed to maintain her objectivity. She may have been the only person in the country, given her position as his sister and her professional reputation, who, if she had spoken out about Donald's complete unfitness for the office, might have made a difference. Well, it's too late now, bitch. But, looking back, nah, it wouldn't have made a difference. They still voted for him. But she had her own secrets to keep. And I wasn't entirely surprised when she told me after the election that she voted for her brother out of family loyalty. So even a judge who knew he wasn't right still voted for his ass. Growing up in the Trump family, particularly as Freddie's child, presented certain challenges. In some ways, I've been extremely fortunate. I attended excellent private schools and had the security of first-rate medical insurance for much of my life. There was also, though, a built-in sense of scarcity that applied to all of us, except Donald. After my grandfather died in 99, I learned that my father's line had been erased from the will as if Fred Trump's oldest son had never existed. And a lawsuit followed. In the end, I concluded that if I spoke publicly about my uncle, I would be painted as disgruntled, disinherited niece who looking to cash in or settle a score. Bitch, you not going to tell me. Because first of all, let's unpack this, bitch. Okay, let's unpack this. Donald Trump's father had dementia. That will, you know how rich people do. They be having wills and shit. They be 25 with a will, bitch. Okay? I believe, and this is my opinion, bitch. When his father started developing dementia, Donald's ass went and had him change that will. <laughs> You know, Lord Valdemar, bitch. I can't. Okay, so. Okay. Let me get myself together. Because this this is this is a great read. I I love this. I, I, I want to stop real quick because I love this book. Because it's not just spitting out a bunch of policies that we knew that he ignored. Or a bunch of shit that we saw in the news that we already knew. This is giving you insight into the madness. And the craziness of who we're dealing with. Or who we've been dealing with. In order to understand what brought Donald and all of us to this point. We need to start with my grandfather and his own need for recognition. Bitch, this is a movie. She's read, this is giving script, bitch. A need that propelled him to encourage Donald's reckless hyperbole. And unnerved confidence that hid Donald's pathological weaknesses and insecurities. As Donald grew up. He was forced to become his own cheerleader. First, because he needed his father to believe he was a better and more confident son than Freddie was. Then, because Fred required it of him. And finally, because he began to believe his own hype. Even as he paradoxically suspected on a very deep level that nobody else did. By the time of the election, Donald met any challenges to his sense of superiority with anger. His fear and vulnerability so effectively buried that he didn't even have to acknowledge they existed, and he never would. In the 1970s, after my grandfather had already been preferring uh, and promoting Donald for years, the New York media picked up the baton and began disseminating Donald's unsubstantiated hype. In the 1980s, the banks joined in when they began to fund his ventures. 
their willingness and then their need to foster his increasingly unfounded claims to success hung on the hopes of recouping their losses. After a decade during which Donald floundered, dragged down by bankruptcies, and reduced to fronting for a series of failed products from steaks to vodka, the television producer Mark Burnett gave him yet another chance. The Apprentice traded on Donald's image as the brash, self-made dealmaker, a myth that had been the creation of my grandfather five decades earlier and that astonish astonishingly considered the vast control of evidence disproving it has survived into the new millennium almost entirely unaltered. And the reason why this is interesting is because Donald Trump is a master class in branding. Okay? We all know that all McDonald's are not created equal. We all know that most McDonald's food is trash. But the McDonald's brand is so worldwide and so recognized and so reinforced that you don't give a fuck if you get a bad cheeseburger. People almost ignore that shit. If people, and think about it, if you looked on Yelp at McDonald's reviews, most of them are probably trash. But nobody cares and it gets ignored, okay? It gets ignored because it's McDonald's. Because the brand is strong. He's a master class in branding. This is probably sidebar. Guys, this is probably the most viewers we've had cabinet since I did Omarosa. We're at almost 800 viewers right now. This is crazy. Thank you for tuning in. Um, we're going to go ahead and finish. we got a few more pages left of the prologue. By the time Donald announced his run for the Republican Party nomination in 2015, a significant percentage of the American population had pr been primed to believe that myth. To this day, the lies, misrepresentations, and fabrications that are the sum total of who my uncle is are perpetuated by the Republican Party and white evangelical Christians. People who know better such as Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, true believers such as Representative Kevin McCarthy, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, and Attorney General William Barr, and others too numerous to name, have become, unwittingly or not, complicit in their perpetuation. None of the Trump siblings emerge unscathed from my grandfather's sociopathy and my grandmother's illnesses, both physical and psychological. But my Uncle Donald and my father Freddie suffered more than the rest. In order to get a complete picture of Donald, his psycho psychopathologies, and the meaning of his dysfunctional behavior, we need a thorough family history. In the last three years, I've watched as countless pundits, armchair psychologists, read bitch, and journalists have kept missing the mark using phrases, phrases such as malignant narcissism and narcissistic personality disorder and an attempt to make sense of Donald's often bizarre and self-defeating behavior. I have no problem calling Donald a narcissist. He meets all nine criteria as outlined in a diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders, but the label gets us only so far. Okay, so this bitch is, she's giving you in this book, she's giving bitch I'm licensed. I know what I'm doing. I'm degree, bitch. Let me let me run this shit down to you. She's giving I'm degree, okay? I love a degree, bitch. I live. I received okay, so she can regular to receipt, y'all. I received my PhD in clinical psychology from the Derna Institute of Advanced Psycho Psychological Studies. And while doing research for my dissertation, I spent the year working on the admissions war of Manhattan Psychiatric Center, a state facility where we diagnosed, evaluated, and treated some of the sickest, most vulnerable patients. In addition to teaching graduate psychology, including courses in trauma, psychopathology, and developmental psychology for several years as an adjunct professor, I provided therapy and psychological testing for patients at a community clinic specializing in addictions. So, okay, so sis said, sis said this. Sis said, bitch, let me run down my receipts so you don't think the read is unwarranted. 
Because, because bitch, I'm qualified. She's giving I'm qualified and you will deal. You will live because I know what I'm talking about. And I said, okay? Um, those experiences showed me time and again that diagnosis doesn't exist in a vacuum. Does Donald have other symptoms we aren't aware of? Are there other disorders that might have as much of a more explanatory power? Maybe. A case could be made that he also meets the criteria for antisocial personality disorder, which in its most severe form is generally considered sociopathy, but can also refer to chronic criminality, arrogance, and disregard for the rights of others. Is there a, uh, can you, is there a common ground for that? Probably. Donald may also meet some of the criteria for dependent personality disorder, the hallmarks of which include an inability to make decisions or take responsibility, discomfort with being alone, and going to excessive lengths to obtain support from others. Are there other factors that should be considered? Absolutely. He may have a long undiagnosed learning disability that for decades has interfered with his ability to process information. Shade, bitch. Also, he is alleged to drink upward of 12 Diet Cokes a day and sleep very little. Does he suffer from a substance, in this case caffeine-induced sleep disorder? He has a horrible diet and does not exercise, which may contribute to exasper exasperate his other possible disorder. The fact is, Donald's pathologies are so complex and his behaviors are so inexplicable that coming up with an accurate and comprehensive diagnosis would require a full battery of psychological and neuropsychological tests that he'll never sit for. At this point, we can't evaluate his day-to-day -day functioning because he is, in the West Wing, essentially institutionalized. Donald has been institutionalized for most of his adult life, so there's no way to know how he would thrive or even survive on his own in the real world, bitch. She's reading. She's reading, okay, bitch. I feel like she just broke down mad disorders, bitch. Because, see, Mary's a smart cookie. Mary's a smart cookie because in Mary spilling the tea about Donald, Mary is also promoting herself as a psychologist. Mary trying to get on Dr. Phil. She trying to get on whatever Oprah programming. This bitch trying to get another book deal. She trying to be, you know, on CNN. This bitch is out here soliciting. She's canvassing for gigs, bitch. So she's going to let you know, oh, I'm qualified. And I'm going to break this down because y'all ain't been breaking it down the way that it needs to be breaking down. So in a page and a half, I'm going to give y'all true tea on what y'all been missing, bitch. She just read. And I get. At the end of my aunt's birthday party in 2017, as we lined up for our pictures, I could see that Donald was already under a kind of stress he'd never experienced before. As the pressures upon him have continued to mount over the course of the last three years, the disparity between the level of competence required for running a country and his incompetence has widened, revealing his delusions more starkly than ever before. Many but by no means all of us have been shielded until now from the worst effects of his pathologies by a stable economy and a lack of serious crisis. But the out of control, co oh bitch, she's giving, and she's giving me time relevant references, bitch. Oh, this book is giving me everything. But the out of control COVID-19 pandemic, the possibility of an economic depression, Deepening social divides along political lines thanks to Donald's penchant for division and devastating uncertainty about our country's future have created a perfect storm of catastrophes that no one is less equipped than my uncle to manage. Doing so will require courage, strength of character, deference to experts, and a confidence to take responsibility and to course correct after admitting mistakes. His ability to control unfavorable situations by lying, spinning, 
and obfuscating has diminished to the point of impotence in the midst of the tragedies we are currently facing. His egregious and arguably intentional mishandling of the current catastrophe has led to a level of pushback and scrutiny that he's never experienced before. Increasing his belligerence and need for petty revenge as he withholds vital funding, personal protective equipment, and ventilators that your tax dollars have paid for from states whose governors don't kiss his ass sufficiently. Bitch! Look, I told y'all. I told y'all this was going to be a good read. I told y'all it was going to be an easy read, bitch. I feel like she's reading for points. She's reading for points, bitch. She's reading for points. Dot com. In the 1994 film based on Murray Wallstonecraft Shelley's novel, Frankenstein, Murray Shelley, Frankenstein's monster says, I do know that for the sympathy of one living being, I would make peace with all. I have love in me, the likes of which you can scarcely imagine, and rage the likes of which you would not believe. If I cannot satisfy the one, I will indulge the other. After referencing that quote, Charles P. Pierce wrote in Esquire, Donald doesn't plague himself with doubt about what he's creating around him. He is proud of his monster. He glories in its anger and its destruction, and while he cannot imagine its love, he believes with all his heart in its rage. He is Frankenstein without conscience. So let's read this quote again. Let's read this quote again. I do know that for the sympathy of one living being, I would make peace with all. Okay? I have love in me the likes of which you can scarcely imagine and rage the likes of which you would not believe. Okay? That could more accurately have been said about Donald's father, Fred, with his crucial difference. Fred's monster, the only child of his who mattered to him, will ultimately be rendered unlovable by the very nature of Fred's preference for him. In the end, there would be no love for Donald at all, just his agonizing thirsting for it. The rage left to grow will come to overshadow everything else. When Rona Graff, Donald's longtime gatekeeper sent me and my daughter an invitation to attend Donald's election night party in New York City. I declined. Rona Graff is also his secretary. You might have heard that name. Um, she's been loyal to Donald around Donald for like ages, decades. I wouldn't be able to contain my euphoria when Clinton's victory was announced. And I didn't want to be rude. At 5 the next morning, only a couple of hours after the opposite result had been announced, I was wandering around my house, as traumatized as many other people, but in a more personal way. It felt as though 62,979,636 voters had chosen to turn this country into a macro version of my malignantly dysfunctional family. Damn, that bitch gave the exact number. Within a month of the election... I felt myself compulsively watching the news and checking my Twitter feed, anxious and unable to concentrate on anything else, like most of us. Though nothing Donald did surprised me, the speed and volume with which he started inflicting his worst impulses on the country, from lying about the crowd size at the inauguration and whining about how poorly he was treated to rolling back environmental protections, targeting the Affordable Care Act in order to take affordable health care away from millions of people and enacting his racist Muslim ban overwhelmed me. The smallest thing, seeing Donald's face or hearing his my own name, both of which happened dozens of times a day, took me back to the time when my father had withered and died beneath the cruelty and contempt of my grandfather. I had lost him when he was only 42 and I was 16. The horror of Donald's cruelty was being magnified by the fact that his acts were now official U.S. policy, affecting millions of people. Another thing about, wow, we had 900 people, over 900 people. Another thing about this book um, that I like, and here's what I like about it, is we're coming up on election time. And reading this book, she's actually reminding me he's done so much shit 
that sometimes it's always something new that I'm actually be like, oh, damn, that happened. Oh, yeah, he did do that. Like, it's so much shit to keep up with that she's actually reminding me of all the crazy shit he did when he first got here. Okay? The atmosphere of division my grandfather created in the Trump family is the water in which Donald has always swum. And division continues to benefit him at the expense of everybody else. It's wearing the country down, just as it did my father, changing us even as it leaves Donald's unaltered. It's weakening our ability to be kind or believe in forgiveness. Concepts that have never had any meaning for him. His administration and his party have become subsumed by his politics and grievance and entitlement. Worse, Donald, who understands nothing about history, constitutional principles, geopolitics, diplomacy, or anything else really, and was never pressed to demonstrate such knowledge, has evaluated all of the country's alliances and all of our social programs solely through the prism of money, just as his father taught him to do. The costs and benefits of governing are considered in purely financial terms, as if the U.S. Treasury were his personal piggy bank. To him, every dollar going out was his loss, while every dollar saved was his gain. In the midst of obscene plenty, one person, using all of the levers of power and taking every advantage at his disposal, would benefit himself and, conditionally, his immediate family, his cronies, and his sycophants. For the rest, there would never be enough to go around, which was exactly how my grandfather ran our family. It's extraordinary that for all of the attention and coverage that Donald has received in the last 50 years, he's been subjected to very little scrutiny. Though his character flaws and aberrant behavior have been remarked upon and joked about, there's been very little effort to understand not only why he became who he is, but how he's consistently failed up despite his glaring lack of fitness. Donald has, in some sense, always been institutionalized, shielded from his limitations or his need to succeed on his own in the world. Honest work was never demanded of him, and no matter how badly he failed, he was rewarded in ways that are almost unfathomable. He continues to be protected from his own disasters in the White House, where a clack of loyalists applauds his every pronouncement or cover up, covers up his possible criminal negligence by normalizing it to the point that we've become almost numb to the accumulating transgressions. But now the stakes are far higher than they've ever been before. They are literally life and death. Unlike any previous time in his life, Donald's failings cannot be hidden or ignored because they threaten us all. This bitch knew what she was doing. She said, I'm going to put this book out right before election time, bitch. We ain't do nothing in 16. I'm putting this book out because motherfuckers need to vote. Although my aunts and uncles will think otherwise, I'm not writing this book to cash in or cash or out of a desire for revenge. If either of those had been my intention, I would have written a book about our family years ago when there was no way to anticipate that Donald would trade on his reputation as a serially bankrupt businessman and irrelevant reality show host to ascend, <laughs> this bitch reads, to ascend to the White House, when it would have been safer because my uncle wasn't in a position to threaten and endanger whistleblowers and critics. The events of the last three years, however, have forced my hand, and I can no longer remain silent. By the time this book is published, Hunt... Hundreds of thousands of Americans' lives will have been sacrificed on the altar of Donald's hubris and willful ignorance. If he is afforded a second term, it would be the end of American democracy. No one knows how Donald came to be who he is better than his own family. Unfortunately, almost all of them remain silent out of loyalty or fear. I'm not hindered by either of those. In addition to the first-hand accounts I can give as my father's daughter and my uncle's only niece, I have the perspective of a trained clinical psychologist. Too much and never enough is the story of the most visible and powerful family in the world, and I'm the only Trump who is willing to tell it. I hope this book will end the practice of referring to Donald's strategies or agendas as if he operates according to any organizing principle. He doesn't. 
Donald's ego has been and is a fragile and inadequate barrier between him and the real world, which thanks to his father's money and power, hey, he never had to negotiate by himself. Donald has always needed to perpetuate the fiction my grandfather started that he is strong, smart, and otherwise extraordinary. Because facing the truth that he is none of those things is too terrifying for him to contemplate. Donald, following the lead of my grandfather, and with com the complicity, complicity, silence, and inaction of his siblings, destroyed my father. I can't let him destroy my country. Bitch! Let's unpack, bitch. Now, if you want to donate to my cash app of Venmo, you can do that. Dapper Dan Midas, D-A-P-P-E-R-D-A-N-M-I-D-A-S. Dapper Dan Midas, either on Venmo or cash app. But, let's unpack this, bitch, because that was a lie. That's just the prologue, by the way. That's just the prologue. Okay? Um, I feel like she's writing this book for her dad. This is a book that I think we're going to be reading. We're, we're, we're going to go to distance with this book. Usually I do about a chapter or two. But like I told you, I said this is probably the best Trump book I'm going to read since Omarosa. And it's because it's giving you an insider's perspective with receipts. And with context. I love that this book is written by a family member who is also a psychologist. Okay. Um, yes, Lamont, that was just the prologue. Okay. We still have a ways to go. Now, because uh, this book is pretty much going to be taking up time, I'm going to do something that I haven't done in a while. And we're going to go back to a schedule. So we will reconvene with this book because I have um, an appointment tomorrow. We will reconvene. Thank you, Jay Elaine, for the cash app, Yolanda. Thank you for the cash app. Y'all, it's cash app in the Okay. Um, we're going to reconvene on uh, Thursday. Thursday at 7 sharp. Okay? And we're going to get into this first chapter because that was just the prologue. That was just the prologue. So this will also give you guys time to get your books, read them, um... And follow along if you want to. And we'll unpack some of the things. Um, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. We had 931 live viewers. We haven't reached that number in a while. So congratulations, Cabinet. We did it. Um, this was crazy. Um, like I said, um, the interesting thing about this book is, like I said, I think she's writing this book for her dad. I think that as we read this book, I can't wait to see what the relationship between um, her father and Donald was. Um, thank you, Veronica, uh, for your donation. I appreciate it, my love. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how this pans out. Um, and uh, it, it's, 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 it's going to be... <laughs> This is going to be one hell of a read. If you're not following me on social media to keep updates, you can follow me on Instagram at Dapper Dan Midas. Everything is Dapper Dan Midas. You can also um, view this if you missed anything, you missed the beginning. I also upload these live readings on... Uh... Thank you, Tammy. I also upload these readings on um, my YouTube, on the Secretary of Shade YouTube. So if you haven't seen it here... You can also go ahead and see it on the Secretary of Shade YouTube and read it and listen to it like an audio book at your own leisure. Um, now, a few rules. Because these books are copyrighted and because they're books, I know a lot of you say, well, DDM Manny, why don't you read the whole book? I cannot read the whole book because it is a copyrighted work. I can only read excerpts as a club. So that's why... If you want to read the entire thing, you will have to purchase the book or, you know, whatever it is that you're going to do with it. Um, but that's why we never read the whole book um, because of that um, that that very reason. Thank you guys for the cash apps. Um, oh, my God. Thank you so much. I appreciate you guys. Um, but that's why you have to 
do that. You know what I'm saying? So we're going to meet up again on Thursday and we're going to get into this um, first chapter. And I love <laughs> this first chapter and this first part because it's called Cruelty. The Cruelty is the Point and it's called In the House. Okay. Um, so read up on that prologue, refresh. If you want to read, go ahead and jump ahead. I don't mind, but I'll be reconvening back. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Melanie. Um, thank you, Nora. I'm going to be reconvening, um, back. Thank you, Renee. I'm going to be reconvening back with you guys on Thursday at 7 p.m. sharp. We're going to go ahead and get into that first chapter and unpack. Um, it's been a hell of a night, guys. Um, it's been a hell of a night um, <laughs> and a hell of a read. We haven't had a read this good probably since Omarosa. Um, and shout out to Omarosa for always supporting and, you know, truly being an ally and um, still keeping in contact with me. Um, even post, it's been, what, almost two years now since we read that book. And two years later, before an election, we're reading this book. We always get these kind of books before elections. Um and um, I appreciate it. And it's Dapper Dan Midas. I'm going to put it in the comments. But um, you guys have a great um, evening. Be blessed. We will reconvene Thursday, 7 p.m. sharp. Um, you guys have a great evening. And I will talk to you soon. Peace and love.